Here's a sports flash from 1420 NBC Sports Radio Tri-Cities, powered by Jeep. Atlanta Braves baseball lost to the Padres yesterday by an 11-4 score. Now that series is set to continue this evening on the mound for the Braves. It will be left-handed pitcher Sean Newcomb. He enters tonight's game with a 6-1 record, a 2.73 ERA. Last year facing the Padres, he beat San Diego 3-0 when he allowed just six hits in six innings, striking out eight. The Padres are set to go with right-handed pitcher Jordan Lyles tonight. He is 2-1 with a 3.65 ERA. College basketball, ETSU has announced the junior college transfer Octavian Corley has signed scholarship papers and he will join the program, a seven-foot post player. He comes to ETSU from Casper College in Wyoming where he shot 63%, scoring close to two points with four and a half rebounds. With Sports Flash powered by Jeep on 1420 NBC Sports Radio Tri-Cities, I'm Matt Pauley. When you're looking for more, you're looking for Crabtree View of GMC. Because at Crabtree View of GMC, we have the price, the selection, and the deals on both stylish Buick SUVs and professional-grade GMC trucks. Plus, in over 60 years of service to our local community, we have always maintained a commitment to excellence. Come experience the difference when you shop at Crabtree View of GMC. It's where your neighbors trade. Off I-81 at Exit 5 in Bristol, Virginia. There's nothing small about your business. Your passion, your hours, your reputation, it's all huge. Your partnerships, even bigger. With Dell Small Business Technology Advisors, you'll get the tech, advice, and one-on-one -on -one partnership to help your business grow. Because with reliable Dell PCs with Intel Core processors, you can focus on what matters most, getting business done. Call 877-BY-DELL to speak with an advisor today. That's 877 It's Terry Hanratty, Socon John Hooper, and Mike Emai. Wow. By the way, Terry Hanratty, I need I, I should have you on here talk about Steve Spurrier, but uh, if you go on the 1420 NBC Sports Radio Tri-Cities Facebook web, uh, you'll see my interview with Steve Forbes, or Steve Forbes, listen to me, Steve Spurrier, talking, yeah, and I know that, yeah, they're teammates and all that. I am kind of curious about what it was like to go with that bad Buccaneers team up to Pittsburgh in 76. Because I know you started that game. i kind of fascinated by that. Oh, what was I going to do? The fascinating. Oh, yes. PN plus ETSU. Remember that. Could do an Alley LaForce. Could do that. Could do a media watch. All right. Tony is coming. Max Scherzer, who comes in with a 9 1 record and a 1.92 ERA. Yankees will send CC Sebastian to the mound for a 7 07 first pitch in Toronto against the Blue Jays, who give the ball to Marco Estrada at 7 10 Eastern in Boston's Fenway Park. Red Sox take on the Tigers. News from the NFL Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski have reported to camp after sitting out the voluntary portions of. I tell you what, you guys, Hanratty, John Hooper, all this, you make me feel like uh, I know Art Rust Jr. used to talk about how Richard Nixon and uh, Mario Cuomo would listen to his show. Kind of felt, yeah. There you go. Maybe I should be, uh, maybe I should be, <laughs> I was going to say here with the theme music, yeah, it's Facebook only again today, but we got plenty of people tuning in, and I want to thank you all. This is Marky e. Bilson, your voice of choice for a new generation of Tri-City Sports fans. The name of the program, Tri-City Sports Now, where, yes, we own the Tri-Cities with the best guests and the hardest-hitting opinions in the market. Or shall I say that I'm the most outspoken member 
of the Tri-Cities market. Today's show, if all goes well, Jerry Bonkowski will talk about uh, the race, certainly Martin Truex Jr., who not only is being tweeted about by Donald Trump today, unlike, well, to a different way, uh, the Philadelphia Eagles were as well, but uh, this time in a good way by President Donald Trump. But we're going to talk about Martin Truex Jr.'s victory in Pocono. He is the defending cup champion, you know. Now the couple of victories on the season as we're now really about halfway, and I guess it's a three-horse race. I will tell you that my take on uh, the race in Pocono was watching early in the first stage, and Jimmy Johnson was leading a lap. And it was, uh, you know, wait a minute, Jimmy Johnson is leading a lap? Really? I mean, and you hate to put it that way, but it really was uh, so shocking. And I got to ask Jerry Bonkowski, is Jimmy Johnson now, what Dale Earnhardt is he? Is he Dale Earnhardt Sr. who went an entire 1997 without winning a race, then came back to win the Daytona 500 in 98? Or is he literally kind of limping along at the end of his career, you know, concussed? Oh, maybe he'll have one last victory. No, no, not really. Not, no, that's not going to happen. But, you know, I, the big national story happened... Uh, after got off yesterday, after the show was over, was the passing of Dwight Clark. Do you realize that Dwight Clark is the fourth member of the San Francisco 49ers? First one in, maybe I should say, the modern era. If one can call the 80s the modern era, I believe they are. There are many who would say that the 60s are the modern era as well. I mean, it's color TV, right? The Super Bowl starts in the 60s. All of the, you know, it's not leather helmets and single wings, possibly. But in the 60s, three people with ALS who played for the San Francisco, excuse me, three people who played for the San Francisco 49ers and uh, went on, well, they, they died of ALS. I'm tr I'm really butchering this statement. Three people who played for the San Francisco 49ers in the 1960s would die of ALS. That's what I'm trying to say. Forgive me here. Uh, Gary Lewis, who was a linebacker, went to California. Matt Hazeltime, he was a running back for six years. I think he went to high school across the street from Kezar Stadium. And Bob Waters... And around these parts, we remember Bob Waters is the head coach of the Western Carolina Catamounts, who led the Catamounts football program, which now is not really thought of as that great of a team. Oh, back in the 80s under Bob Waters, Western Carolina was an FCS, then called Division I AA power. They played for the... 1AA National Championship in 1983. I remember Kenny Edwards, who was the quarterback at Brevard High School in North Carolina. He had led the Blue Devils to the state title in 1982. And then he was redshirted in 83. I remember watching that championship game against Southern Illinois. They got smashed. I think the final score was 43-7. to And i tell you how smashed it was. I remember... Uh, Bob Waters, actually, fourth quarter of the game had been decided, put in a backup quarterback, right? And he broke his leg. They had to put back the starter. <laughs> and I was like, Kenny Edwards, I was in the stadium when he won the, the state title and all that. But he would go on and he'd play uh, for several years, for four years at uh, Western Carolina. But yeah, Western Carolina was a football power. And in fact, for by ETSU standards, and boy, it's hard to, for me to believe it was 24 years ago, but I can recall in 94 when ETSU, their final game of the regular season, was a victory against Western Carolina. Greg Ryan uh, was able, he's now the coach, I believe, at Greenback, and he was able to uh, lead the Buccaneers to a last-minute touchdown drive in Cullowee, North Carolina. And the Buccaneers finished with the 6-5 and five record and probably knocked 
Western out of the playoffs. They finished seven and four. They probably would have made it eight and three. At least that was the public perception. And it's debatable, but they were in the hunt. And it was the first time in seven years that ETSU had a winning record. But it was a big deal. They had beaten Western. Now, really not so much. You know, Western's a little bit better than they were, where they went, you know, about 10 years without a winning record. But, yeah, the uh, at one time the Catamounts, and that was when Bob Waters coached them. And also just remembering ETSU and Western Carolina back at that time in the 80s. I remember 1987, I want to say. Could have been 86, but I want to say 87. ETSU played at Western Carolina. And the game was nationally televised. It was a Thursday game on ESPN. ESPN was very much in there. At 87, they didn't have all the contracts, you know. But yeah, ETSU and Western Carolina nationally broadcast on ESPN in prime time. Like you would see today, a uh, you know, say a Conference USA or an American football game. American Athletic Conference. Maybe the MAC. You know, somebody put those games on weekday, prime time. Well, they did that here with the Southern Conference. Bob Waters was the coach, and even then, he had started to succumb to ALS. And you started wondering, and I hate to put it as if I'm mocking here, but you did start to wonder what was in the Kizar Stadium locker room that three San Francisco 49ers would die of ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Lou Gehrig, had, you know, that's what he succumbed to. And it, it robs you of your motor skills. You know, it, it's, it, you become, uh, you know, unable to use your limbs and your body. Uh, well, Dwight Clark suffered from that. Another great 49er. And he passed away yesterday at the age of 61. Everybody talks, everybody talks about Clark and the catch. That's what he'll always be remembered for. Franco Harris will be remembered for the Immaculate Reception. David Tyree for catching a ball off his head. You know, uh, it's tight since Clark, I, I'll even throw this out because Clark was from Clemson. Uh, Bobby Gage will be remembered for a 97-yard touchdown run in the NFL. He went to Clemson for the Steelers uh, in 49. He's in the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest time. But if you only know Dwight Clark for the catch, you're failing to recognize an otherwise stellar football career both on and off the field. By the way, you can read about this in Medium. I put the, my uh, what I'm going to tell you, my monologue, as I always do, up on Medium. Now, Clark was winless at Clemson. Or, excuse me, he's not winless at Clemson, but far from it. Witness at Clemson. Sometimes you don't read this right. Witness at Clemson. I'm not Obama with the teleprompter. I sometimes uh, have a malaprop. His 62-yard touchdown reception, Dwight Clark's, back in 1978, gave the Tigers their first ACC championship in 11 years. Went on to play the Gator Bowl, the famous Woody Hayes hits the Clemson linebacker game. Yeah, that was Clark's last uh, college game. Clemson was 11-1, and finished sixth in the country, a precursor to the 1981 national championship. In fact, uh, Cliff Austin was a running back on both that 78 squad and the 81 national champions. And I think in many ways that touchdown, just like the catch would pave the way for the 49ers dynasty in the 80s, I think in many ways the touchdown that Clark scored against Maryland in 78 paved the way for Clemson's success under Danny Ford for the next decade. Their own dynasty, so to speak. Uh, following 81 season, following the heroics of the clutch, it's just 10th round draft choice. Clark led the NFL in receptions the following year. And although he'd be overshadowed by Jerry Rice when Rice arrived on the 49ers in 84, every receiver in the history of football has been overshadowed by Jerry Rice. So, you know, what's the big deal? Clark, number retired, 87. 
Uh, his number was 87. Had more than 500 catches in the NFL. Two Super Bowl rings, real place in football war. And then he moved to the front office. And he eventually became San Francisco's general manager in 1998. 49ers went 12 and 4. Remember, that was, you know, Steve Young to Terrell Owens to beat the Packers at the end? Yeah, he was the GM. That was his last victory for the 49ers as a general manager. Really, I guess the last victory you would enjoy with the 49ers. He was part of the organization, you know, under the DeBartolos, when they won three Super Bowls. He was a member of the front office. And when they won three Super Bowls, 88, 89, 94. And then when the Cleveland Browns were revived in 1999, he became basically their general manager. Had a different title, I think, director of football operations, vice president, that sort of thing. Stayed on until 2002. 2002 is the only year that the revived Browns, and I know that the NFL, and I think that every team should have this, by the way. I mean, uh, but uh, yeah, I they uh, have decided that let's, even though it's sort of the restart of the franchise, they're the Cleveland Browns, so, you know, the Browns can, of this, this Cleveland Browns can claim their 1964 NFL title, even though all the players moved to Baltimore in 96, you know, there's, there was actually Brown's offices in Berea, Ohio, that were still open for the three years they didn't play, you know, all that sort of stuff. I don't know if you're aware of that, but yeah. So anyway, when the Browns were revived in 99 with the same history, uh, they've only made the playoffs, though, the new Browns one time, 2002. After Clark left, they never made the playoffs since. Second longest drought of a postseason in major North American sports, uh, only the Seattle Mariners, believe it or not, have gone longer. Mariners are in first place, too. But yeah, Clark's going to be remembered for the catch. And I know some people of a certain generation may not have the great appreciation for the catch that I do. I mean, we can even discuss whether that sent the 49ers to the Super Bowl or if Danny White's fumble at midfield in the ensuing drive put them in the Super Bowl that was played in Pontiac, Michigan. Yeah. Anybody remember that? They, I mean, not the Super Bowl, but yeah, that for, and the Cowboys got the ball back 51 seconds. White completed the pass to Danny White. He was a quarterback of the Cowboys midfield, and then he fumbled the ball away at midfield. And I remember Hank Stram saying, 51 seconds is plenty of time for the Dallas Cowboys. Oh, that sort of thing. But the thing was, the catch marked the start of the 49ers dynasty, just like the Immaculate Reception started the Steelers dynasty. Now, I am a proud child of the 1980s. And the 81 season was the first I really followed from start to finish religiously. And one could really see the 49ers dynasty taking shape that year. Oh, I mean, I watched games before then. I watched the Super Bowls, you know, and all that. I have, very, I have memories, Super Bowl 14, Steelers winning it. But a lot of it was, you know, and I talk about I lived in 79 in Pittsburgh, City of Champions year, and that's what made me a sports fan. Yeah, it did. And I mean, I remember a friend of mine taking me to a pirate game that was actually a key pennant race game. But uh, the fact of the matter was, it was more the environment, more than, you know, Willie Stargell hits the home run that wins the World Series that I remember. You know, it was the environment of being all around. And that's big. And that's something that people, I think, that, you know, I'm a Dallas Cowboys fan in Mountain City, Tennessee. There's a difference between that and being a Dallas Cowboys fan in Dallas. There really is. It's the environment. It's everyone in the community coming together. But that 81 49ers team, you could really tell it was going to be something special. I remember they even defeated the Steelers in midseason, and I wasn't all that upset about it because you could tell the 49ers were an up-and-coming team. Yeah, Montana against Bradshaw for a long time. It was the only game where the two quarterbacks who had four Super Bowls before Brady exceeded them played against each other. 17-14, 49ers, uh, I think November 1st, 1981. Mel Blunt, I remember, had a pick six 
of Montana. That was my uh, big memory, and I can remember Bradshaw throwing a touchdown pass over the middle, but the Steelers came just short, but I remember thinking, but they just lost to this really good up-and-coming team. Wouldn't have thought that two years before, but now, you know. The other thing the 49ers did that year, they beat the Cowboys in the regular season, week six, 45-14. But when the NFC Championship game came about, oh, there were a lot of writers who just were, no, America's team is going to win this game. Tom Landry had done it 10 years before against San Francisco, beat the 49ers three straight seasons in the playoffs, sometimes in dramatic fashion. Steve Spurrier, we had him on on Friday. He was the quarterback of record of the 72 49ers that went to the playoffs, won their division, but lost on the same day of the Immaculate Reception, by the way, as Dallas scored 17 points, I believe it was, in the final quarter, one of Staubach's heroics, that sort of thing. But I want you to understand this. 49ers have been in the NFL since 1950. They started in the old AAFC. But uh, since joining the NFL in 1950, they had only made the playoffs four times previous to 1981. That was just the fifth time in their history, 32 seasons, that they were in the playoffs. And Dallas was Dallas. I mean, they went to the playoffs every year. They had a winning record every year. America's team. They were coming off a 38 nothing playoff victory, and they weren't an old team. It was Danny White now. It was Tony Dorsett in his prime. You know, there were a lot of good young players on the Cowboys, and they were favored by three points, even though the game was played at Candlestick Park, 81 uh, NFC title game. But, you know, I was growing up, so were the 49ers. Very likable team with the Golden Knight, uh, you know, Joe Montana, as well as a lot of proud veterans. Ray Wershing, who never looked at the goalposts before he kicked a field goal. Always used the hash marks, which are in the NFL parallel with the goalposts. The great thing. Ray Wershing is a great kicker, 49ers head. Uh, Hacksaw Reynolds, how could you miss Hacksaw Reynolds? Yeah, that was, this was far before I understood he sawed his car in half after, you know, the 38 nothing, uh, you know, mules loss to Ole Miss. You know, far years before that, Freddie Solomon was you know, star receiver. People forget about Freddie Solomon from the University of Tampa. They had all played so well for so long, but they never enjoyed the fruits of their labor. I mean, the 49ers before that 81 team, they, you know, they'd won 10 games in a season once in NFL, in all their years in the NFL. Okay? And meanwhile, the Cowboys, we kind of still consider them this with Jerry Jones. They were arrogant. The Cowboys have always been arrogant. How can you be America's team when you always lose to the Steelers? Really? Monday Night Football, Howard Cosell, he was intelligent. He was insightful. Don Meredith, Corny, unprepared, what was he doing on there? Heartland Appeal. I think Bradshaw does it better. Now, on a personal note, my mother and I, we'd moved from Pittsburgh to a town called Huntington, Pennsylvania, where she could teach at Juniata College a year before. And even at that young age, for me, there was a lot of culture shock, one of which was not everybody in town rooted for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now, I could understand rooting for the Philadelphia Eagles living in central Pennsylvania, I didn't agree, I could understand, but how do you pull for the Dallas Cowboys in Huntington, Pennsylvania? Home of the Bearcats, 64th winningest high school football program in the country, by the way. Storyline is established. Frisky young Colt, Joe Montana, and the 49ers playing the established standard. It was so big, I remember my grandfather, not the biggest sports fan in the world, actually watched this game instead of traveling to build his retirement home in the North Carolina mountains, which he did almost every weekend. For me, there could be no bigger hype. What could possibly be a bigger ball game? My grandfather was going to watch this and not build on his retirement home? I mean, that was unheard of. That was absolutely unheard of. So here's Dallas up 27-21 late in the game. Five minutes left. Held just shy of advancing into field goal range, it would put the game away. So the Cowboys punt. Danny White, last punter quarterback in the NFL. Solomon, Freddie Solomon, fields the ball, falls on his rump at the 11. And I remember just clapping my hands. Here we go. Montana can do it. I mean, I'm, you know, 11 years old, you're watching a football game. You know, actually, I'm 10. I'm, how old am I? 
82, yeah, 82. So I'm really, you know, January 82. I'm 11 years old. And you think the world's going to end if your team doesn't win, right? You know? And then Montana, sure enough, did it. Twice on the drive, converted on third down in the process of taking the ball to the Cowboys' six. He did it by throwing to his wide receivers, not dinking and dunking. There was even a reverse to Solomon on that drive. Relived it this morning. Linville Elliott, there was a name from the past, nondescript running back, somehow didn't get the attention Bill Ring did in the 49ers' backfield. He just picked up seven yards to advance the ball to that Cowboys' six-yard line for a third and three, 58 seconds left. Niners got one timeout left. I remember thinking, Bill Walsh has got to call a running play here. Even if you don't get it, you get two yards, fourth and one, you can pick that up, right? You got a timeout, kill the clock. But if 49ers didn't run the ball, they were going to throw. Oh, no. Oh, no. Montana is being rushed. D.D. Lewis, Tutel Jones, Larry Bethay. Montana rolls to his right. Nobody's open. Oh, no. He throws the ball away off his back foot. Jones is leaping to the sky to knock down the pass. Montana can't possibly see what's in front of him. Oh, God, no. And then Dwight Clark, who wasn't even supposed to be running in the direction he was, beats Everson Walls, who was up for the Hall of Fame last January, by leaping to the moon and catching the ball with his mitts and somehow kept his feet in bounds. Oh, yes. There was even a cherry on top. If you can go on YouTube, you can see the replay of the game. And if you watch right after that touchdown catch, the ensuing crowd shot on television captured one lonely Cowboys fan in a white coat showing her dismay among a sea of San Franciscans going crazy as only San Franciscans can. I remember watching the TV highlights on the news afterward. He actually used to do that, you know. And it always, they kept this, captured this one female fan. And said, oh, no. You know, it, was just, it was beautiful. I mean, it was the antidote. You won. I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan from Pittsburgh. How do you root in Huntington, PA, in a classmates for the Dallas Cowboys? You're not from Dallas? Come on. And so seeing a Cowboys fan, you know, shrink, I loved it. And that was it. Montana's on the next color of time. Cover of time. Time also uses a red outline, and the 49ers have red uniforms, so it works out. They was also on the color of time. But yes, Joe Montana was on the cover of next week's Time magazine. Nobody was surprised about it. I remember seeing it and saying, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Two weeks later, in the Super Bowl, Alcoa's fantastic finishes. Remember that? They relived the play. Proof Clark had somehow instantly, overnight, become iconic in that play. We knew it was something amazing when it occurred. And meanwhile, children of the 80s wishing to sell their hometowns out now pulled for the 49ers, not the Cowboys. A torch had been passed with the catch. Now, there have been memorable plays since then. Home run throwback. David Tyree catching a ball off his helmet. Tony Dorsett running 99 yards for a TD. Great drives. No way to beat the Browns. Montana to win Super Bowl 23. Ben Roethlisberger to win Super Bowl 43. And that play, that pass to San Antonio Holmes, kind of mimics also the catch of Dwight Clark. Been great dynasty. Cowboys in the 90s. Patriots of this century. And, you know, the Redskins, Giants... Packers, Steelers, Broncos, they've all snuck enough Super Bowl victories in during that time that they've made it interesting. But don't you see, Dwight Clark was the innovator. His leap mixed all those elements that I'm talking about right there together. And even if you want to argue the Immaculate Reception, Begat the Catch, plays so great, dramatic, unexpected, inspiring... One doesn't even have to be reminded of the players or the situations. You know, 72 Steelers didn't go on to win the Super Bowl. 81 Niners, they did. I'm Marky Bilson. I'll be back after this. Mox of Jonesboro, come in and browse a fine selection of accessories, including Willow Tree, Vera Bradley, Fires, Choice Carolers, and while you are there, 
try out the most comfortable chairs in the world, Tempur-Pedic and Stressless by Equines. Simply the best comfort available. Fox is located on 101 West Main Street in Jonesboro since 1891. Fox of Jonesboro. Save more with Liberty Mutual Insurance. Hey, what are you doing up here on the roof? I want to tell the world that spent the woman of my... Your NBC Sports Radio update starts now. Tennis from the French Open. The 20 seed, Novak Djokovic, trailing two sets to one to Marco Cecchinato. Earlier, the seven seed, Dominic Team took care of the two seed, Alexander Zverev, in straight sets. And on the women's side, the 13 seed, American Madison Keys, advances to the semifinals with a straight set win. Baseball today at Target Field, White Sox and Twins at 4:10 Eastern in D.C. Rays will take on the Nats at 7:05. Nate Eovaldi, who's 1-0 versus Max Scherzer in search of his 10th win. Yankees take on the Blue Jays at Rogers Center. Sabathia versus Marco Estrada, and the Brewers face the Indians at Progressive 7:10. Horse racing, the Belmont Stakes, of course, is Saturday and can be heard on NBC Sports Radio. We will learn post position today at 5.30 Eastern. I'm Pete Fox. This is NBC Sports Radio. I used to have a sweet tooth. Had it removed when I was a kid. So what do I crave instead of chocolate? A big red box from Granger. Granger satisfies my craving for great customer service. With 24-7 support, effortless ordering, and same-day pickup or next-day delivery options. No busy signals, no cavities. I love Granger. You know why? Because when it comes to reliable product and technical support, Granger's got your back. Call or click Granger.com to see for yourself. Granger, for the ones who get it done. You check things all the time, like your email every 10 seconds or your ex's Instagram. But what about checking something as important as your credit? Well, Discover makes it quick, easy, and best of all, free. Discover is now offering FICO credit scores to everyone for free, even if you're not a customer. And checking your score won't hurt your credit. We call it the Discover Credit Scorecard. And once you know your score, you should check to see if your current credit card is the best fit for you. Check your credit, compare your card. Go to discover.com slash credit scorecard. Limitations apply. Save more with Liberty Mutual Insurance. Hey, what are you doing up here on the roof? I want to tell the world I just met the woman of my dreams. What about you? I want to tell the... Save more with Liberty Mutual Insurance. Hey, what are you doing up here on the roof? I want to tell the world I just met the woman of my dreams. What about you? I want to tell the world that Liberty Mutual saved me seven hundred and eighty-two dollars. Liberty did what? Alan, you've got it. I'm going to get to that later on. In fact, I'm going to talk about uh, the Washington Capitals. So yeah, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to be talking about. And you could save seven hundred and eighty-two dollars. Liberty Mutual Insurance, based on a recent countrywide new customer survey, coverage is underwritten by Liberty Mutual Insurance Company. Save more with Liberty Mutual Insurance. Hey, what are you doing up here on the roof? I want to tell the world I just met the woman of my dreams. What about you? I want to tell the world that Liberty Mutual saved me $782. Liberty did what? They saved me $782. Bucks. Oh, you go first then. $782 bucks really puts finding love into perspective. Visit us online to get a quote and you could save $782. Liberty Mutual Insurance. Based on a recent countrywide new customer survey, coverage is underwritten by Liberty Mutual Insurance Company, Equal Housing Insurer. Here's a sports flash from 1420 NBC Sports Radio Tri-Cities, powered by Jeep. Atlanta Braves baseball lost to the Padres yesterday by an 11-4 score. Now that series is set to continue this evening on the mound for the Braves. It will be left-handed pitcher Sean Newcomb. He enters tonight's game with a 6-1 record, a 2.73 ERA. Last year facing the Padres, he beat San Diego 3-0 when he allowed just six hits in six innings, striking out eight. The Padres are set to go with right-handed pitcher Jordan Lyles tonight. He is 2-1 with a 3.65 ERA. College basketball, ETSU has announced that junior college transfer Octavian Corley has signed scholarship papers, and he will join the program a seven-foot post player. He comes to ETSU from Casper College in Wyoming, where he shot 63%, scoring close to two points with four and a half rebounds. With Sports Flash powered by Jeep on 1420 NBC Sports Radio Tri-Cities, I'm Matt Pauley. When you're... Just want to mention here, since you heard that sports update, do you realize the Braves were, after losing yesterday to the Padres uh, by the 11-4 score you just heard, still have a game ahead of the Nationals in first place 
in the National League East. Do you realize that they've dropped 15 of their last 17 to the Friars? Do you realize that? Think about that for a second. And now we will return with this message from Crabtree Buick. When you're looking for more, you're looking for Crabtree Buick GMC. Because at Crabtree Buick GMC, we have the price, the selection, and the deals on both stylish Buick SUVs and professional grade GMC trucks. Plus, in over 60 years of service to our local community, we've always maintained a commitment to excellence. Come experience the difference when you shop at Crabtree Buick GMC. It's where your neighbors trade. Off I-81 at Exit 5 in Bristol, Virginia. Gather with us in Truvy's Beauty Salon for Steel Magnolias at Barter Theater. There isn't a bond quite like the one between Southern women and the beauty shop. Humor and heartwarming friendship shines through in this much-loved show. Gossip, laugh, share recipes and beauty secrets with your favorite barter actors. Tickets start at just $20. Call 276-628-3991 or visit bartertheater.com today. We are still seeing a few clouds here and there, but the sky will clear up later for a sunny afternoon. If you've spent any time outdoors, you've probably noticed a bit of a breeze. Winds are blowing through the area at up to 6 miles per hour. The temperature will rise to a high of 80 degrees this afternoon. A low of 59 will come later in the evening. Partly cloudy skies are in the forecast for tomorrow, along with a 20% chance of rain. It's going to be fairly windy out as well. A moderate breeze will blow in from the west at up to 10 miles per hour. This is Mason Self for the News, 103.9 Livewire Weather Center. Count on it. In Greenville, it's mostly cloudy and 73. In Johnson City, it's mostly cloudy and 76. In Irwin, it's clear and 72. Tennessee Arts and Heritage Center, 106 Unicoi Village Place in Unicoi, is a museum to showcase mountain arts, crafts, music, and drama. Tennessee was the original Cherokee name for our great state. Get involved with the many activities Tennessee Arts and Heritage has to offer, from organic gardening to pine needle basket making. Hope you'll visit the Tennessee Arts and Heritage Center soon for upcoming summer fun. Visit TennesseeArts.org for more information. <laughs> 